I'm going to try to answer a viewer question quickly today. We'll see how quick I can be. One of my big points in discussion of readability of the King James Version is one that I haven't been able to back up very well, I'll be honest. I've tried to argue in authorized the use and misuse of the King James Bible that it isn't enough to point out that there are archaic words in the King James. There have to be distinctions made among these words. There are dead words and there are false friends, for example. But what has been more difficult for me to discuss are the other elements of readability. Those are not as easy to verify or to teach, and I frankly don't have the skills quite as well, I think, as I do with looking up words, individual words. But I got a question from a viewer about Luke 8, 19 to 20, that's right. And I think this is going to give us an opportunity to talk through all the different kinds of things, or many of the different kinds of things, that cause contemporary readers to trip up when it comes to the archaic English of the King James Version. Um, those of you who use the King James exclusively, this video can help you learn how to read the King James, at least in one narrow place. Those of you who are wondering, should I be reading the King James Version? Should I make it my main Bible? Might also get some instruction out of this video. And those of you who wonder, why does it need to be that modern translations exist? Why do they change stuff? I'm going to give a number of examples of why they quote-unquote change stuff. Did I say quote-unquote? I quoted the quote-unquote. That's not good. Don't do that. Let me read the question that I got from a viewer. He wrote, Dr. Ward, I ran across this passage and found it to be surprisingly confusing. I even had my wife read it and confirm the difficulty. I think Luke 8, 19 to 20 is a prime example of needless difficulty in the King James Version. He points to, for the press, by certain, stand without. We'll see that in a minute. All of these mean different things, he says, in modern English, and he's right. So here's the verse. Then came to him his mother and his brethren, and could not come at him for the press. And it was told him by certain which said, Thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to see thee. Let me go through every bit of these two verses in the TBS, that's the Trinitarian Bible Society, Westminster Reference Bible, marking up the places where the Elizabethan English diverges from our common speech and writing patterns today. We're going to be kind of exhaustive and kind of nerdy with this video. Let's talk first about word order. Word order is not working according to contemporary English expectations in the very first clause. Then came to him his mother and his brethren. Word order in contemporary English expects that you would put the words in an order more like then his mother and his brothers, we'll talk about that, came to him. It's not impossible to put the verb first, but it's certainly not as if the Greek somehow emphasizes the coming and therefore put it first, or emphasizes the then and therefore put it first. No, this is just archaic Elizabethan English word order, or it is a reflection of the Greek word order. Now, let me point out that when you translate any text, word order is one of the things that you have to translate. Sometimes you can reflect the original language word order, even if it's a little bit off to contemporary ears. But here is a place where I don't think that ought to have been done. We just do not talk this way. It is unexpected, and therefore it is a bump on the readability road. Now let's talk about word choice. Let's look at this word brethren. Brethren. This is a common word in the King James Bible, and it isn't all that hard. That is, it is common enough today, but it is a false friend. I'm actually officially adding it to my list, even though I haven't even considered it in the past. Because I see in this context, then came to him his mother and his brethren, it's ambiguous. Uh, those of you who are experienced King James readers will immediately pick up, it's talking about his brothers, but that is not the way we use the word brethren anymore. I looked it up, and the word brethren is uh, defined today at, in our English as fellow Christians or members of a male religious order. When we talk about the brethren, we are talking about uh, brothers within our religious group, okay? We're not talking about our biological brothers. Brethren is not used anymore to talk about biological brothers. So in this and other places where it occurs, the, the word in Greek is just brothers. I won't uh, give the Greek word. I could do it off the top of my head, but I don't want that 
to be a bar to people to listen to my videos. So I very rarely use Greek and Hebrew words out loud. Then came to him his mother and his brethren. It just means, and we would put it in our English in this way, then his mother and his brothers came to him. That E-N ending, like oxen, is a very old, although still present, like an oxen. Um, plural ending, we would typically put an S on the end of a word that marks this word brethren as a very old word as it does for the word oxen. Let's talk about another phrase, and could not come at him, could not come at him. Um, in contemporary English, what does it mean to come at someone? <laughs> well, it's a very aggressive thing. To come at somebody is to um, make a plunge toward them that threatens to punch them or something, maybe tackle them. And you think of someone coming at someone else and and the, his buddies, you know, restraining him and trying to say, hey, break it up, break it up. We wouldn't say come at him. We would say, then his mo mother and his brothers uh, came to him, but they could not come near him. We would probably say near at a place like that um, instead of come at. That is a way they could speak in Elizabethan English, apparently, that I just don't think is available to us anymore. It, it means something different. Now let's talk about for the press, for the press. Let's talk about press first. Press is a word that we still use, but if you look in the margins of the TBS Westminster Reference Bible, it defines press rightly as crowd. The crowd here is the Greek word, and the um, that Greek word is translated by the word crowd or multitude in the King James itself. It is occasionally translated as press. We do have the word press in that sense. And I looked it up and it's a closely packed crowd or mass of people or things. Among the press of cars, he saw a taxi. But given that we've got the word for here, um, and that's unexpected, we would say because of, we wouldn't say for. Uh, his mother and his brothers could not come near him because of the press. I think that would be possible. I don't think that would be common. I think that would make a lot of people think that a bunch of reporters are standing in front of Jesus and they can't get near him because of the press. No, I, you know, I can't say for sure that that's a false friend that a lot of people would misunderstand it. I have to do some research on that one. I just know that contemporary English much more expects because of the crowd. So this verse would be in contemporary English just the way it is in contemporary English translations. Then his mother and his brothers, not brethren, came to him and they could not come near him because of the crowd. N none of those, none of the individual differences that I've just named, none of those individual elements of readability is particularly difficult. And I believe that I could read this verse just fine as a child. I don't know what age, 10, 9, 8, I I'm not sure. Um, but when you put them all together, it certainly is an unnecessary barrier. All of the archaisms, all of the different ways they said things back then are unnecessary barriers to contemporary readers. I, I would love to see what a study would do to demonstrate how well people are understanding this. Um, I have a little difficulty, frankly, guessing when it's more than just words when we're talking about phrases like this. But let's go on to the next verse. And it was told him... That also is archaic Elizabethan word order. That is uh, something we would say instead, he was told or he was informed by certain. Actually, this is in italics in the King James, and that means that it is added by the translators. It was told him by certain. They are putting that in in order to clarify, but it doesn't really clarify for us because it's elliptical, and we wouldn't say that. We have we would have to say by certain people. That would be a way of leaving it unspecified, but we can't say any longer. It was told him by certain. No, we would say something more like, and uh, it was told to him. No, no. <laughs> And someone told him, something like that. He was told, he was informed. I don't think we would have by certain at all. And in fact, that is what you see in modern translations. They don't say, uh, they don't have anything right there. And it was told him by certain, okay, in other words, it was announced to him, it was told to him, um, 
uh, the reason they add by certain is so that they could say which said, but even right here, this word which, witches don't say things. Witches are not people in English. Yes, we have witches, W-I-T-C-H, but which used to be in Elizabethan English, uh, a relative pronoun that could be used for things or people. But now what do we use? Of course, we use the word who. We would say, and someone told him, or we would say, and it was told to him by someone who said, thy mother and thy brethren, there's that word again, we would use brothers. I'll just write that over. Your mother and your brothers, thy mother and thy brothers, stand without. Okay, here are some uh, other little things that you may or may not notice as divergences from the way we do things in English. Have you noticed that there is a capital letter in the middle of this sentence? Thy mother and thy brethren. Why is it there? It actually is indicating in a way we do not anymore. This is not the way we do it. The beginning of a quotation. We would uh, indicate that with, I'm going to erase a little spot here so I can have a place. We would indicate that with quotation marks. Two quotation marks here, and we'd put two quotation marks outside the period right here at the end of the quotation. But instead, the King James capitalizes that letter. That is yet another uh, divergence from contemporary English expectations for writing, and therefore yet another bump, not an insurmountable one, but a bump. Uh, combined with many others on the readability road. Thy mother and thy brethren stand without. If you have a TBS ref Westminster Reference Bible, you see this little asterisk that leads you over to this asterisk without means outside. In contemporary English, you don't stand without. The person who hears that would be saying, stand without what? <laughs> like, without can't be an adverb like it's used here. It has to be a preposition, and it has to therefore have an object of the preposition. I was at camp many years ago, and they had this silly skit where they played on this, and the king was in his throne room, and somebody comes in, uh, you know, a guard says, Sire, there is a man without. And the king says, without what? And the man says, without the gate. And the king says, well, give him the gate. And it's, you know, uh, it's funny because we all, uh, those of us who are of a certain age, who have a certain amount of exposure to archaic English, recognize that without could be used that way. I predict that that joke's going to be less funny over time. Less and less children are going to laugh at it at camp because less and less of them are going to be familiar with this kind of usage. My mother and my brethren stand without. They are standing outside. In other words, outside the crowd desiring to see thee. Here's another little point here. Uh, I've made this on the channel before, but look at this word thy, look at this word thee. We've got, um, or there is one other, isn't there? Mm, oh yeah, thy right here. Thy mother and thy um, brethren want to see thee. I think almost anybody who has any exposure to Elizabethan English in the King James Version knows that thy and thee are singular second person pronouns, okay? Their corresponding pronouns in plural are ye and you and your. These are plural, okay? Those are plural second person pronouns. This is... Uh, another aspect of difficult readability, even though I readily acknowledge that even as a small child, I picked this up. And I think even beyond the church, many, many, I would say the vast majority actually of contemporary English speakers, especially those with any sort of education or exposure, they know what thy and thee mean. They are second person pronouns. And I think they intuit that they are uh, uh, singular second person pronouns. But Here's a point. I, I've just never seen anybody who defends the exclusive use of the King James Version, never seen them address. I've made a video or two about it. Thy and thee operate on two levels of meaning. There's the prosaic level in which thy and thee are singular second person pronouns, like I just said. But then there's the social register level. What if you actually heard someone say, thou art a knave in public? You would either think, they are joking. Well, you know what? I think you would think they were joking in almost any circumstance. The only exceptions would be in some kind of religious 
or solemn ceremony. And then even then, I think you would think, aren't they laying it on a bit thick? <laughs> like nobody says thy, thee, and thou anymore except in Shakespearean plays, okay? Thy, thee, and thou actually communicate something that they did not communicate in the days of Elizabethan English. These words were in the process of morphing. They're actually toward the end of that process. They're actually dropping out of the language. Only Quakers have held on to them because they actually preserve a form of direct address that was informal. Thy and thee are, um, were informal. And you and ye and your were more respectful, like in Spanish, usted, uh, even though that's plural, is actually used to address people that you have some respect for. So when I speak to adults who are older than I am, I use that in Spanish. Whereas tú uh, is like thou. This is called the TV distinction, which is tú and vu in French, blah, blah, blah. This gets pretty complicated. I write about it in my book. You can read about it more there. Um, but instead of this coming off as a very standard thing that anybody could say, then his mother and his brothers came to him, but they couldn't get near him because of the crowd. And someone told him, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wanting to see you. This so all of a sudden sounds solemn. Then came to him his mother and his brethren, and could not come at him for the press. And it was told him by certain which said, Thy mother and thy brethren stand without desiring to see thee. It makes it, it, it puts an even bigger gap of history between us and the events of the Gospels. That's not completely bad. I think that we need to be reminded at times that they stand across a large 2,000 year historical gap from us. I just don't think this is the way to do it because I think along the way, and in order to do that, you erect a bunch of unnecessary linguistic barriers in front of people. Um, I've marked this all up. If I were to pull out an ESV and mark up its departures from the way we talk, I would come across far fewer examples simply because the ESV, the NIV, the CSB, the NASB use contemporary English. All the stuff I've marked up, once again, and I'll close with this, all of it, every individual element is one crack in the sidewalk. It's, it's one little bit of that sidewalk that's been dislodged over the years. And if you're watching your feet and if you're aware that you're stepping on a sidewalk that's been weathered with a great deal of age, then you're, you're probably going to be just fine. You're not going to trip and fall flat on your face, not in these two verses. Um, but for people who are just reading the Bible for the first time, for people who aren't very good readers, Every one of these divergences from contemporary English is utterly unnecessary. Can anybody tell me that's really radically different to say, then his mother and his brothers came to him, but they couldn't get near him because of the crowd, and someone told him, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wanting to see you. Like, did I change the meaning at all? The meaning of what was inspired in the original New Testament Greek? No, I did not. I simply translated it into contemporary English. And that means that I have, at this very small level, in these two tiny verses, I have been able to edify others by communicating to them part of the story in an intelligible way. 1 Corinthians 14 says that edification requires intelligibility. When we teach the Bible, when we preach the Bible, when we uh, read the Bible on our own, we are going to encounter difficulties. That's abundantly clear. The Bible says that parts of the th some, some of the things that Paul wrote are hard to be understood. Peter said that under the inspiration of the Spirit. But why would we add unnecessary difficulty on top of the difficulty of the content? Difficulty that comes now in a different bucket, a bucket called archaisms. And these archaisms come in all shapes and sizes that if you're used to the King James, you grew up on it, um, you may not even notice. You might have read that just fine. Honestly, I think I did at some point in my childhood. But the people who contacted me had trouble, and I think many other people will have trouble as well.